All right, let's get back to the movie. So Harry realizes they are not heading towards Julie's. Fred's like, yeah, sorry, I lied. So Harry, he takes Fred's gun and demands that he turns the truck around. But Fred's like, yeah, not happening. But the best I'll do is slow down on the freeway on ramp and you can jump out, <laughs> which he does. He then flags down a guy in a convertible at gunpoint and is like, you have to drive me to Park La Brea now so I can rescue a girl I met this morning. <laughs> but the guy's name is Wilson. And he's played by Michael T. Williamson, another one of many actors in the movie who was born in 1957, him on March 4th, in St. Louis. And he started working in his teens, around 18, and has done, like every other actor in the movie, a ton of TV and film work. He was on the TV show Alice... Give Me a Break, Miami Vice. Oh, he was in two 80s movies I absolutely love. Streets of Fire in 1984 with Diane Lane and Amy Madigan. And Wildcats in 1986 starring Goldie Hawn. But his biggest film role came after Miracle Mile. When he was cast in 1994's Forrest Gump as Bubba. Everyone remembers Bubba. I mean, there's an entire restaurant chain that exists because of Bubba. It's probably his biggest movie, but he was actually in a ton of big ones. Heat, Waiting to Exhale, Con Air, Three Kings, Fences. In fact, he really has not stopped working since he started. But the problem with Wilson picking up Harry is that he's low on gas. So they have to pull into this gas station and, oh, you know, I said in the beginning of this tour that the film only strays from the Miracle Mile in the very beginning for a quick montage in Santa Monica, but I forgot the gas station scene, it was actually filmed downtown, but we are not going to go there because a building now stands where it once was and it's not even supposed to be downtown in the film. Harry was not on the truck that long. But all sorts of ridiculous action happens there. It turns out it's a gas station for taxi cabs only. Then the cops pull in. It's a whole nightmare resulting in the cops catching on fire right before the entire place explodes. At which point I'm sure Harry's like, shit, I hope there's a missile coming or I am screwed. Scary thought, but does make you wonder. I mean, movies do make us think. What would you do if a missile was heading your way and you had just over an hour to make a move? I mean, provided you even believed the person who was telling you. Would you even trust a stranger in a diner? Or would you be more like Roger and say, yeah, no thanks, you kids have fun? Think about it. If your entire city believed that a missile was coming? I mean, you think those toilet paper fights during the COVID pandemic were bad? Just wait until everyone in your town hears that they have one hour to get to Antarctica. Chaos. Pure chaos. In the original script, Harry was written much older. He was a divorced trombone player returning to LA after 15 years for a gig. He gets the missile is coming phone call and decides to save his ex-wife and kid, neither of whom he has seen in 15 years. And it would have most likely starred Gene Hackman or Paul Newman, both of whom were at one time close to playing Harry. It would have just a wow that would have been a completely different film and look i love gene hackman and paul newman is my favorite male movie star of all time no question about it but we've seen them both do this before this race against time action role gene in the poseidon adventure and paul in the towering inferno 
And believe it or not, the first drafts of Miracle Mile were written in 1978, just a few years after both of those films came out. It took 10 years to get this movie made. And eventually, the role of Harry was written as a 30-year-old, which I think works so much better because it allows for him to be a little more naive and it excuses some of the dumb choices he makes. And boy, does he make a handful. After he and Wilson flee the burning gas station in a stolen cop car, <laughs> they head here to Julie's apartment. Harry, he finally explained everything to Wilson, what was going on, filled him in on the nuclear attack coming, and even tells him about the helicopter plan. Not only that, though, he tells Wilson to wait four minutes so that he can run up and grab Julie. Yeah, dude, the guy you just carjacked is really going to wait for you to grab your crush and her nana. Wilson, he predictably flees, but in his defense, he realizes Harry isn't that far from the Mutual Benefit Life building. Plus, he wants to go rescue his own sister. I didn't know until right now whether or not they filmed inside this building, and they did. The resident directory is electronic and now out front, but aside from some upgrades, the layout is the exact same. Sometimes they just use the exteriors of buildings and then build the set on a soundstage for the interior action, but not in this case. Pretty sure Julie and Grandma lived on a sound stage or another set because Harry goes down a long hallway and breaks down the door and there's no long hallway in this building that leads to any apartments. Pretty sure it was another set somewhere. But Harry is met by Grandma and her enormous rifle, but he's like, don't shoot, it's Harry. You met me this morning in the courtyard when you jumped out from behind those balloons. She's like, oh yeah, you were such a sweet man, what's up? He tells her what's happening and that they have 20 minutes before the helicopter leaves or else. And I love it, Grandma instantly trusts this guy and is like, yeah, sure, go ahead, kidnap Julie. Grandma leaves with Harry and a very passed out Julie. She even tries to give her a diet pill to wake her up, but Harry's like, no, let's let her sleep so she doesn't know what's going on until she absolutely has to and oh I love this scene so much when they get to the lobby grandpa is waiting Harry had left a voicemail for him from Johnny's when he was trying to get a hold of Julie but they're not grandma and grandpa to me anymore they're Lucy and Ivan two people with a very long and complicated past who both know what's about to happen and they just let it all go. They put it all behind them and decide to spend their final minutes together. And also, someone left a shopping cart in the lobby, which Harry sees as a perfect form of transportation for getting Julie over to the helicopter. We are in front of another one of my wish I had filmed here sooner locations. LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, 
It starts right here, but there used to be another structure, I guess a building that ran along in front of this one, and it's pretty prominent in the movie. However, right after lockdown in 2020, a Twitter user captured a stunning video of it being demolished, and there was a lot of chatter about it because it just sort of happened really without any public announcement. And you can see down there, something is being built. Those massive cranes are no joke. But thanks to our beloved Hancock family, ground broke on the construction of the original LACMA complex in 1962, and it opened three years later in 65. It was a cool complex. Three large pavilion buildings hovering over reflective pools. However, tar from the pits next door started seeping up into the pools, and eventually, by the 1980s, it had to be filled. So in 1986, that new structure was built, and 1986 it was. It had these glass blocks on the front facade that just scream the decade. The Courtyard Plaza was entirely closed off as a result, and then in 2008 and 2010, the current buildings that sit here were each built. This building opened in 2008. It's called the Broad Contemporary Art Museum, and also that year, this magnificent art installation was created by an artist named Chris Burden. It's called Urban Lights, and it consists of just over 200 vintage street lamps from the 1920s and 1930s, most of them originating from the streets of various LA neighborhoods. Chris began collecting them in 2000. He was buying them at flea markets and various sales, and then he created his piece here eight years later with the intention of having it as the grand entrance to the new and improved LACMA. Obviously, it has since become one of the most Instagrammed locations in all of LA, which I think is great because the museum says that it's gotten a lot of younger people inside the actual museums. And you can really see why people love coming here. It's very mesmerizing. It also happens to sit right where Harry pushes Julie in the shopping cart. A metaphor, the shopping cart of baby carriage, and he's taking care of her. But they leave Park La Brea and they cut through the backside of the LACMA buildings that no longer exist. Julie is in her volume-based haze and just thinks Harry is taking her on the funnest date ever to make up for his oversleeping. But if this had existed back then, he would have definitely pushed her through here. Harry and Julie end up out here on Wilshire just as reunited Ivan and Lucy pull up. Julie, she's just stunned to see her grandparents together, smiling, laughing, in love. She wants to all get food so she can hear the story, find out what prompted it, but Ivan and Lucy have decided that they want to go to Cantor's Deli on Fairfax Avenue and have their last meal together there, alone. Harry, he catches their drift. They don't want to get on the helicopter. It's a very bittersweet, touching scene in the movie. But Harry's goal, it's just to get Julie on that helicopter. So they run across Wilshire to the 5900 building here. And I could kind of pretend that these are the steps they run up. Looks just like it. Oh, there's also in this scene a car that has these two women. Landa clearly called them from the catering truck. They pull up like maniacs in front of the steps and... While it looks pretty much exactly like it does in the movie, it was actually filmed on the other side of 5900, 
and it's been completely redone. I walk over there, but you can see this entrance, which hasn't been redone, and you can get an idea of what the other side looked like. Like LACMA, this building was renovated in 2008, and the following year that art installation went in. It's called the Wall Along Wilshire. It's 10 pieces from the original Berlin Wall, which is ironic considering the movie takes place at the end of the Cold War. So, okay, this movie, it's an hour and a half, and only 12 minutes of it takes place in the daylight hours. And it was all shot in just seven weeks, mostly at night. Anthony Edwards said that he would get off work at like six in the morning and would want to wind down with a beer. So he'd be at diners and restaurants drinking while everyone else was grabbing breakfast. God, from here, I mean, it really looks like a stadium is going in. What are they building? It's gigantic. This is actually where Harry and Julie cross from though. It looked just like what you saw a minute ago, but part of the renovation included removing the steps for this flat walkway. Also, the lobby was entirely redone. Would have been a hoot to go inside, but nothing is recognizable. And it needed it. Not only are businesses inside of this building, but tenants live here as well. And there are a couple of scenes on the roof. And unfortunately, I'm not going to go up there. First of all, the property manager said I couldn't. But the scenes, they weren't even filmed on the actual roof. They used a building in downtown LA because this building doesn't really have a helicopter landing pad. But they did film in the lobby and in the elevator. Oh my gosh, a haunting moment. Julie, she's still trying to process grandma and grandpa together again, and she says they swore they'd never talk to each other again until their dying day. Harry, he just looks away. It's really chilling. Plus, Julie, you know, she really wants to be with her grandparents. I'm on the fence about this part of the movie. I think he should have told her the truth by now so she can decide how and where she wants to go. I mean... Maybe she doesn't want to run away to the South Pole with you or any of those awful people on the roof that Landa recruited to join. But in addition to the obnoxious women she summed, there's this gross guy just bitching up a storm. His name is Gerstead, and he's played by a great character actor everyone has seen, Kurt Fuller. Would take an hour to list his credits. Supernatural, The Good Wife, Parenthood, Scandal, and those are just a few of his later shows. He's been working since the mid-80s. The same year he did this, he did Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Anyway, he's part of the awful chaos happening on the roof, causing Julie to really wonder what the hell is going on and why they need to take a helicopter anywhere. Doesn't really matter, though, because there is no pilot. He was a no-show. Harry decides there's just no time to wait. They have to go find one in the middle of the night. He <laughs> begs Julie to stay by the helicopter for five minutes. I love that he thinks he can find a pilot in five minutes. But he runs off to try, and Julie picks up from those terrible ladies that they're actually all planning to head to Antarctica. It's so funny, too. Julie actually runs to the side of the building and shouts Harry's name. He's down here, and he supposedly hears it. I mean, that would never happen. But he does feel bad for leaving her with no explanation, but he's determined to run off and find a pilot. So he starts by accosting a street sweeper who pulls onto Wilshire from Spalding Avenue. Harry chases him down, and this is where you really see the old 1986 LACMA facade. Harry runs alongside the sweeper, asking him if he can fly a helicopter, and the guy's like, no, of course I can't fly one. Get the hell away from me. But it's a really terrific shot, capturing the late night, early morning feel of a practically empty Wilshire Boulevard. All of these locations that you've seen, they were all very intentional from the get-go. 
I mean, it is called Miracle Mile, but it was the setting from the very beginning, and it, you know, took a decade for this film to get made. It's pretty remarkable that all the spots that they originally wanted were actually available. This skyscraper, it wasn't too old when Miracle Mile filmed here. It was completed in 1971 for the Mutual Benefit Life Company. In 2008, Variety took over as their West Coast headquarters, but as of 2014, the building has been the official West Coast headquarters for the SBE Entertainment Group. It has 32 stories and has businesses as well as residential tenants, like I said, and just like the score of Miracle Mile, this too is really a character in the film. The writer and director of this gem of a film, Steve DeJarnett, he uses his sets and locations really as well as any other film director I've ever seen, which is why it's even more mind-blowing to learn that this is his only feature film, the only feature film he ever wrote and directed. And, you know, I purposely have not mentioned him yet on the tour because this is how you watch the film. You don't know anything about him. You've most likely never heard of his name, and, you know, you see it at the very beginning, but you have no idea what to expect. Not in the way that you would, you know, watching a John Hughes or Tarantino or Greta Gerwig movie. He is the heart and soul and brain of the film, and you get the luxury of witnessing it without any preconceived notions. Well, <laughs> until now when I tell you about him. He was born in 1951 in Longview, Washington, and he always wanted to live in Southern California, so he attended Occidental College. This is where his interest in film took off, and he even studied at the American Film Institute at one point, but Steve had the idea for this movie in his head for quite some time. He grew up in the 60s and had that fear of war instilled in him with Vietnam happening and seeing it all over the news and hearing horrible stories growing up. Eventually, his career kicked off in 1978 after he made a short film called Tarzana. He was able to score an agent from that, and this eventually led him to be able to pitch his script called Miracle Mile to a man named Mark Rosenberg at Warner Brothers, and coincidentally, Mark's brother Alan would go on to play Mike in this film. Well, Warner Brothers bought it, and they put the wheels in motion to make the movie, but the only problem was they wanted to bring in writers to change the ending, and Steve said no, absolutely not. The stipulations are that I direct it, and that the ending does not change, ever. Now, as all of this was going down over time, Steve wrote a movie, now a cult favorite, called Strange Brew, that starred Rick Moranis and Dave Thomas. Well, he earned $50,000 from that movie, and with that money, he bought back his Miracle Mile script from Warner Brothers. And this all went down in 1983, around the same time that American Film put out a list of the best unproduced scripts currently floating around Hollywood. Well, the Miracle Mile script was on that list. This got Warner Brothers thinking, wait, we want to make a Twilight Zone movie. What if we just use that Miracle Mile script? So they came up with an idea to get rid of their two obstacles, Steve wanting to direct it and Steve not wanting the ending changed. Well, that idea was money. Warner Brothers offered Steve $400,000 to own Miracle Mile and whatever ending they saw fit. And Steve said no, not a chance. He was adamant about his ending. He had a vision, and it was important to him not to sell the film's soul. And Warner Brothers, they wanted the ending to all be a dream. Harry wakes up, and the whole thing starts all over again, kind of like a first early Groundhog's Day. But Steve felt that was a cheap shot, to make an audience sit through a film only to have it be a dream. No way. So he really held his ground, and he continued spending the next few years struggling and starving, but he just knew that he'd somehow get this movie made the way he wanted it made. After getting, well, no help at all from the street sweeper, 
Harry, he sees a few people heading into a 24-hour gym, and sadly the entire building is gone. Well, you know, it really wasn't much to look at anyway, but the gym inside was 80s gold. Harry runs around back to go inside of it, and honestly, I was hoping he was gonna run into the gym being like, hey everyone, great news, a nuclear missile is heading to LA, we're all gonna be dead soon, so we don't have to work out anymore, yay! But instead, he's running around like a lunatic, firing off his gun, demanding to find someone who knows how to fly a helicopter, anyone, and miraculously, I mean, well, they don't call it the Miracle Mile for nothing, he finds a pilot. He doesn't have a name in the movie. He's listed as Power Lifter. But in real life, he is Brian Thompson. Oddly enough, he too was raised in Longview, Washington. He was born on August 29th, 1959, and grew up a self-called closeted theater kid. He played sports, but secretly auditioned for school plays and secretly studied drama. But he has not stopped working since the mid-80s, when his first screen gig was <laughs> getting his clothes yanked off of him alongside Bill Paxton by a naked Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Terminator, another actor from this movie in The Terminator. He then co-starred alongside Sly Stallone in Cobra. Honestly, another movie that I would love to do a story location tour on because it really has a ton of great L.A. locations. But anyway, I love this scene in this gym because out of nowhere... He, well, okay, so he tells Harry that, yes, he can fly a helicopter, but he needs to know why the urgency... So Harry tells him what's going on, and he's like, okay, fine, but I too have someone in my life that I want to save. Leslie has to come with me. So he grabs Leslie, who of course is working out nearby, and <laughs> Leslie turns out to be a guy. He's like, you don't have a problem with this, do you? And Harry's like, no, not at all. Let's just go. It's really a non-issue in the movie and totally unexpected. Well, I mean, they are in a 24-hour gym, so it's not that shocking. But for the movie's sake, it's just another non-issue, like Roger in the diner. And the only reason I bring it up is to remind you that this was the late 80s. That was not happening in the movies. Not a casual mention of someone being gay. Back then, it was an issue, or the storyline revolved around it. Not in this, though. It's just normal and not a thing. Ironically, though, back then it was a big deal to play gay, a big risk. Celebrities, actors, they weren't out, and I don't know this actor's sexuality, but according to the internet, he was married to women and has children with women, so it was probably even a bigger risk as far as his career was concerned, but it didn't hinder him whatsoever. And, I mean, today, if there was a movie where the guy saving everyone was gay, there would be a small mob of pesky people calling it woke with an agenda, but really, Harry's only agenda is saving Julie. I have no idea what's being built here, but the boys exit the gym from back here, and suddenly, and this kills me, Harry can somehow hear Julie running up and down Wilshire, screaming for a helicopter pilot, so... He tells the couple, look, I have to go grab someone, but meet us on the mutual benefit life roof in a few minutes. Please don't leave without us. He even takes out a wad of cash to prove how serious he is. Again, Harry, trusting a random stranger to wait for him as he takes off running down Orange Grove Avenue here to once again rescue Julie. last building in the movie is definitely the boldest. It is the Peterson Automotive Museum, and it's been here since 1994. 
However, in 2015, they had a $125 million renovation, giving it the look you see now. This red exterior covered by these incredible stainless steel panels. I absolutely love this building. I'm sure a lot of people don't, but it houses race cars, sports cars, all kinds of cool cars. It should look like this. But underneath it all sits the former site of Orbach's department store. It went out of business in 1987, but it was a staple in the world of Los Angeles department stores. Right here in the Miracle Mile since 1948, sitting here on the corner of Fairfax and Wilshire, right across from its competitor, the May Company, the Automotive Museum was also founded in 1994, and they chose the location of this former department store because it was relatively windowless and would offer protection against the possible damage that natural light could cause to the cars on display. It's really cool inside. You should definitely check it out if you're in L.A., Plus, they were all so nice when I asked if I could go on the roof earlier to show you Johnny's. You can't really see much in the lobby, but right after Orbox closed, Miracle Mile filmed here and probably had a blast destroying it because Harry spots Julie just as a police car comes barreling through the intersection, crashing its way right into the department store. Julie! Julie and Harry run into Orbox to see if anyone is hurt, and Harry realizes that it's the cop car he stole, and that the driver is Wilson. Julie, of course, has no idea who Wilson is or what's happened, but turns out that after Wilson ditched Harry at Park La Brea, he picked up his sister and then became part of a police chase once cops found out about the stolen car. The reason they crashed through the department store is because they had just been shot by cops. Wilson's sister, she's basically unconscious, and she only has a couple of lines, but I have got to point her out because, in my world, she's an 80s legend. Kelly Jo Minter. She's in a handful of my favorite movies. Summer School, Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Lost Boys, People Under the Stairs, the movie Mask, the one with Cher, House Party, New Jack City. I really do. I love her. Oh, and she also did a uh, season two episode of ER with Harry himself. September 24th, 1966 is her birthday, and she is from North Trenton, New Jersey. She got married in 1992 and had three kids, and after that she worked sporadically, but I would really love to see her work a ton more. She is really great. Look, I'm a pop culture guy, so I have to tell you a great pop culture story real quick. I was at a party here once on the roof of the museum, and the surprise guest was Michael Jackson. It was in May of 2008, a year before he died, and I believe it was his last public appearance. It was definitely one of them. Uh, you know the brand Ed Hardy? Well, it was the guy behind it all, Christian Audigier. It was his 50th birthday. I didn't know him. It was a friend of a friend thing, but he threw a wild party. I mean, Britney Spears was there, Fergie and Snoop Dogg were there. They both performed. Then all of a sudden they were like, Christian, someone wanted to come here and personally wish you a happy birthday. And out came Michael Jackson and a ton of confetti. No one had any idea. The place went absolutely bonkers. I didn't meet him or anything, but I was about 10 feet from him. I videoed the moment. I have it somewhere. Just one of those LA random moments I had to share. From 1994, when the museum took over this building, up until the 2015 renovation, there was this giant monster truck attached to the side of the building that would just hang here on Fairfax. It's pretty cool to drive by. And it was hanging there the night something tragic happened, right out here on this very block on March 9th, 1997. Christopher Wallace was shot and killed. 
better known to the world, of course, as the Notorious B.I.G. or Biggie Smalls. Ironically, he worked on a song with Michael Jackson. But on this March night, he was leaving a Soul Train Award after party, which was held here at the museum. And at around 12.30 a.m., he left in a large black Escalade. He was sitting at a red light here on Fairfax in the front passenger seat when a black Chevy Impala pulled up and fired four bullets right into his body. He was taken to nearby Cedar sinai Hospital and was pronounced dead at 1.15 a.m. Oh, it was... Oh, I mean, I had only lived out here for two years and I was a teenager when it happened, but it was such a monumental moment out here. In the party that night, it really included a who's who of incredible talent. Missy Elliott, Queen Latifah, Faith Evans. Oh, Aaliyah was here. The Wayan Brothers... There's footage of Biggie's final moments alive taken right inside this garage here. And there are a lot of theories as to who shot Biggie, who was responsible for this. Some say it was a retaliation for Tupac's drive-by murder, which only happened the September prior. Some people think Suge Knight did it. Really a bunch of different theories. But what's wild to me, looking back, when it happened... Well, you know, Biggie, he was just this larger-than-life man, this adult. But he was actually only 24 when he died. A kid. Just a kid. The rapper known as Biggie Smalls was shot several times as he sat in his Chevy Suburban early this morning outside the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles. Smalls had been attending a party honoring winners of the Soul Train Music Awards, at which he made an appearance Friday night. What's up, Cali? After the shooting, Smalls was taken to Cedar sinai Medical Center, where he was pronounced dead. So, inside the store after the crash, Julie figures out from Wilson that Harry is the one who received the phone call that a nuclear missile is coming and that he is the one who has caused all of this chaos. But instead of Julie being like, you caused this? Is this happening because of you? She has more of a, wow, Harry, I'm sorry you had to experience that phone call attitude and the cops they've now surrounded the store telling everyone to come out with their hands up and julie's like no harry let's just go tell them the truth this will all be okay and the scene this is great it happens in a clock store just such a great metaphor time just tick tick ticking away harry and julie oblige the cops by surrendering but When they get out here, the cops are like, nah, screw it, we're out of here, because pandemonium has started. People on the streets are panicking, cars are flying by, and there's another cinematic moment I just love, because I'm all on board now with this couple. It's clear they have a connection, and she's choosing to believe this phone call was real, so now I'm totally rooting for them as they hold hands and take off running through this intersection back to the scene of their first kiss, when the world felt perfect. Harry remembers that the phone call happened because this chip called the wrong LA area code trying to get a hold of his father, so Harry decides to use the same payphone number but using the other area code to see if this chip guy really exists, and Julie, meanwhile, she walks into her place of employment and realizes everyone's gone except for another (laughs) Mary Poppins-like street person. Oh, and a coyote, if that doesn't symbolize the end of times. Well, sure enough, Chip's father does exist, and he picks up the phone, basically confirms that, yeah, his son works in a missile silo, so now Harry is even more confident that, yes, this is all still happening, even though the missile should have been here by now. And I can't remember if I mentioned this or not, but once Harry gets that initial phone call, the rest of the movie is, it's in real time. So that last hour plus is really intense, and things are about to get even more intense.
all hell has really broken loose. I mean, word of mouth has traveled far and fast in a world without the internet, by the way. People are now acting psychotic. They're looting, stealing. The entire city has just gone mad. And for some insane reason, Harry and Julie got split up again. It's just chaos upon chaos, but it's really such a spectacular scene, especially for a movie that had a budget just over, a little over a $3 million budget. That's it. And their special effects budget, it was something like $20,000, something ridiculous. But filming the finale right here caused this intersection to be shut down for two whole days, something that would probably be much more difficult to get done these days. Well, who knows? I mean, <laughs> this film would probably be rebooted or remade today with AI or CGI, but back then, a lot of actual hard work went into filmmaking, and this movie is proof of that. So, who ended up financing this movie? A production company called Hemdale Film Corporation. They began making movies in the 70s, but really hit their stride in the early 80s, and then they hit it out of the park in 1984 with The Terminator, which makes sense why so many actors from that movie are in this one. They also did Hoosiers in 1986, but they had huge success with back-to-back -back Best Picture Oscars, 1986's Platoon, and 1987's The Last Emperor. Then came this movie. <laughs> no Oscars. Oh, but at the Independent Spirit Awards, Mare was nominated for Supporting Actress, and Steve got a nomination for Best Screenplay. The movie, however, was not a box office hit. I think it made over a million dollars in its initial run. It finished 169th out of 200 movies for 1989. By comparison, however, Turner and Hooch, co-starring Mare, finished 12th. Oh, this is cool. Here on the Academy building, the artist included Cantor's Deli, which I mentioned earlier. It's where Julie's grandparents wanted to have their last meal before being nuked. It's still open. It deserves its own story location tour. It's just up a couple blocks on Fairfax. And Steve DeJarnett, the writer and director, he seems like a really cool guy. He's pretty active on the internet. He's given a lot of Zoom interviews recently, and he says he'd like to see this movie rebooted or given the multi-episode series treatment. He would love to see the original idea play out, an older couple reuniting after their divorce, I'm all for it, if they include him in the process, and if they use this exact same intersection. Oh, they could do so much with the Academy Museum, have some characters in there. I mean, I would totally break in here if we had an hour to live. You would absolutely find me dead in Cher's Oscar dress. Steve DeJarnett follows the footsteps of Alfred Hitchcock by giving himself a quick cameo in the movie. Harry, he escapes the madness by crawling through the underground sewage tunnels, and when he looks up, he sees a man fall face first into the sewer grate, that's Steve, with a great shot of this building behind him, which is where Harry ends up. He climbs out of the tunnel, which happens to empty him in the lobby back here, where, surprise, he runs into Julie, they reunite in the elevator, and this time they make a commitment that no matter what happens, they stay together, even if that means dying together. They get to the roof, only to find that crazy guy Gersted scarier than ever, and no helicopter whatsoever. All right, before we conclude this story and I tell you the ending of the movie, don't worry, I'll give you plenty of warning before I do, I just have to tell you my favorite behind-the-scenes story of this entire film, and it's something that just happened a couple of years ago. Remember in the beginning of this tour when I said that something happened between two actors? Well, after this movie came out, Anthony Edwards, of course, went on to star on ER for, oh geez, I think for eight seasons, 1994 to 2001. 
Well, he was married. He got married in 94 and had four children with his wife. In season five of ER, Mayor Winningham had a recurring role for three or four episodes. And like I said, she too was married and she had five kids. She got divorced in 1996 and was married again from 2008 to 2012. Well, Anthony and his wife divorced in 2015, and five years later, in 2020, right before the pandemic, Anthony found himself living in New York, single. And so was his old co-star, Mare, who he had always remained friends with. Well, they met up, sparks flew, the timing was right, and after growing even closer during lockdown, the two eloped in 2021. <laughs> How fantastic is that? 30 years after playing Harry and Julie, the two found love in real life. And we are right back, and this is right where we started the tour, out here in front of the Tar Pits, which also happens to be where the movie starts and ends. It's where Julie and Harry start and end. Just so many full circle moments happening right now. Well, this just seems way too good to be true. <laughs> I was hoping we would see this. And almost on cue, just like at the end of Miracle Mile, a helicopter has appeared. And if you don't want the ending of the movie spoiled, then maybe just turn the volume down for... Into, well, I'll, when I edit this, I'll put something up there letting you know that the spoiler is over. But the power lifter, he returns from making a trip to LAX and he picks up Julie and Harry as promised. However, seconds into the flight, the missiles are in fact launched and this causes the helicopter to, well, it crashes right here into the tar pits. Julie and Harry, they're trapped amidst the panic. They make light of the fact that maybe one day their bones will be found and put in the museum where they met. They promise each other that their souls will stay together, and then they die. Everyone does. Gone. They all die. Well, it fades to black. <laughs> There's the ending. I mean, you can see why no studio wanted to make it with this ending, but Steve wanted it that way. And I love it. In fact, it's probably why I love this movie. It's so bold, but it's true to the story. I mean, a nuclear missile is heading their way. Of course they're going to die. They have to. Well, unless some of the characters manage to find safety. And who knows? That crew from the diner could have very well made it to Antarctica. But I'll tell you what. You spend about ten minutes or so getting to know them, all these characters at Johnny's. And once Harry jumps out of the truck, you never see them again. I actually think I talked about them longer than they appear in the film. Actually, a reboot would be amazing if they kept the diner characters and cast the same actors at their age now, you know, as survivors. Denise Crosby in her 60s calling all the shots still? Sign me up. I'm watching that. Actually, I don't know, though. A Miracle Mile without Anthony and Mare, it's just too hard to imagine. I mean, this movie works because of these actors, their talent, their chemistry. I can't imagine anyone else in these roles. Oh, I forgot to mention, actually, at one point, Nicolas Cage and Jennifer Tilly were considered to play Harry and Julie. Which I can't even picture it. Uh, uh, Julie, there's a missile coming. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> See, no, it doesn't work. Anthony and Mare, they're too perfect. I have to mention that in 1995, Mare starred in a movie called Georgia for which she received an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actress. It co-starred Jennifer Jason Leigh and was written by Jennifer's mother, Barbara Turner. She wrote a ton of stuff, <laughs> including the screenplay for Cujo. Mare, she didn't win the Oscar, but she won another Emmy for the 1997 miniseries George Wallace. And really, she continues to do great work. I think we're going to see her win an Oscar one day. I do. Anthony, too. I think they're both going to be these incredible older actors. At least I hope so. I love them both so much. And <laughs> I love you, all of you, for watching this. Seriously, this is just, it's so much fun for me, and I really love having you along with me. I'm sure a lot of you haven't even heard of this movie, so thank you for indulging me. And those of you who love it as much as I do, I hope I honored it. 
and for Steve DeJarnett. It's his baby, and he's very generous with it. He talks about it a lot. He shares stories online. Oh, he has a fantastic website that you have to check out, stevedejarnett.net. Tons of great photos and memorabilia. And I, of course, love this neighborhood, the Miracle Mile. Not just a movie, a great place to work and live. And if you have any stories or anything you'd like to share about this neighborhood or about the movie, please comment. I know it sounds trite to say this, but I truly do. I love reading your comments about these videos. And I can't wait to get started on yet another story location tour. Until then. Thank you.